Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Community Archives in the Cloud with Bite for Bite grantees. Um, thank you all so much for being here and good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I am Amanda. I'm the Community and Partnerships Manager at Permanent Legacy Foundation. And I am currently living in Tucson, Arizona, um, which is on Pacific time. So I'm gonna pass it over to Zach, who's going to introduce himself. Hi everyone, I'm Zach Ellis, the founder and CEO of Their Story. I'm coming from you today uh, from Seattle, uh, although I live in Rochester, New York and where I typically can be found. Pleasure to, to be here with everyone today. I'll pass it back to you, Amanda. Thank you. So we have a very um, packed agenda today. Um, we are gonna go through quick their story and permanent introductions, just to give you a little bit of background on who we are, how we work together. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Bite for Bite program and how to apply for that, which I know is the reason that all of you are here. Um, and then we are also going to do panelist introductions because we have five Bite for Bite partners who have graciously volunteered their time to talk about their projects and share a little bit of insight with you all today. After that, we're going to have an open Q&A panel discussion um, where Zach and I will be asking questions. Um, if you have questions during that time, please make note of them during your um, during the presentations and um, lead up to the panel discussion and then we'll be taking those through chat and then at the end we're just going to do a quick wrap up so i'm going to pass it over back to zach so that he can do a quick intro to their story absolutely Oops. thank you amanda so their story is an end-to-end -end platform for oral history and and it's maybe a little counterintuitive, but in a time where we are drowning in information, valuable information is being lost. And when we're more globally connected than ever before through the internet and through social media, we're more polarized uh, than ever before. And I think there's a real hunger for, for connection. And these are the exact problems that their story uh, is built to, to help solve. Um, if you could go to the next slide, uh, Amanda. Um, and specifically building um, an end-to-end -end experience around how to collect and preserve uh, materials so that it can be used for future generations, but also how to share and cultivate that knowledge uh, uh, over time. Um, it's not enough just to, to collect and preserve, but also how can we engage uh, each other in conversation, in dialogue, uh, so that we can reflect on our past and make intentional uh, change uh, moving forward. And ultimately, since April of 2020, uh, Amanda, if you step forward one more slide, uh, there's now over 70 institutions that are using their story, uh, everything from large research universities like uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, um, where their students are the knowledge and content creators uh, as they interview and engage with community members and create you know, podcast episodes uh, or digital exhibits uh, to engage in alumni, uh, to exploring their own history of, of how black uh, students, teachers, uh, you know, faculty, staff, alumni have been uh, treated throughout the years. So everything from organizations like that to uh, under-resourced communities uh, like the Chickaloon Native Village of the Atna Tribe in South Central uh, Alaska who are preserving their native language through the platform, as well as a number of uh, our panelists here uh, today as well. And so uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with the diversity of, uh, of organizations and communities to make the process of oral uh, history uh, accessible and allow any organization or, or community to uh, take ownership over their own narrative. So. Um, really glad to be here. And that's just a brief uh, intro on, on their story. So I'll, I'll pass it back uh, to you, Amanda. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zach. 
So the Permanent Legacy Foundation works closely with their story um, and we provide the long-term storage for digital preservation to folks who use their story. Um, and many of those people are Bite for Bite partners. So the Permanent Legacy Foundation's mission is to preserve and provide perpetual access to the digital legacy of all people for the historical and educational benefit of future generations. We, as a nonprofit, are working to create a truly different kind of organization that leverages the unique effectiveness of tried and true institutional models of cultural heritage preservation at the scale of a digital cloud storage available to anyone. So we provide cloud storage. Um, we also provide preservation services for folks who um, need help getting their materials digitized. That is primarily for individuals. So think of like genealogists and the family keepers of all of the documentation um, and photos and everything um, related to family history. And then the other part of that is our Bite for Bite program. And Bite for Bite is... Um, a core part of our approach to digital preservation because we provide free secure cloud storage to nonprofits who have limited means or infrastructure to support digital preservation efforts that are typically employed by larger cultural heritage institutions. So the maximum storage amount, this is just a brief snapshot of um, what the grants provide but the maximum storage amount is 100 gigabytes. And we do work with partners who need more or less than 100 gigabytes, but that's kind of what we, the, the realm that we tend to operate within um, initially. We also, I'm gonna come back to the intern um, stipend because that's a new thing. Um, as I mentioned, we work with nonprofit organizations. So that is um, why you all are here. And the expected output um, for our partners in this is that they create some sort of public digital collections, exhibits, and community engagement with digital preservation efforts or community archives. Uh, the application is available year round. So um, if you apply at any point during the year, it'll just be added and reviewed during the next grant cycle. And the upcoming one is August 1st. So I mentioned that the internship is a new feature of the grants. Um, we are working with local library and archives programs to pair them with um, nonprofits in their communities. So that means if you live someplace where there is um, a university that has some, some related program um, to what you do, we're willing to work with you to find you an intern. They will work with us, we will pay them, and um, we'll build your capacity to uh, do preservation projects in your, in your realm. So by working alongside nonprofit partners across the United States, uh, Permanent is helping to ensure future generations have access to the diverse and vibrant legacies of individuals, organizations, and movements by way of grassroots organizations who steward these materials um, that tell invaluable stories and help shape the historical record. So you'll see on this slide, uh, just a brief snapshot of some of our public archives created by groups and organizations who currently use permanent for their collections. And now the best part of our program um, is our Bite for Bite partners. So we are super excited to have them here. Um, and I would just, love to pass it over to Margie, who's going to kick us off and give us a brief introduction to what their digital preservation project entails. Hi everyone, I'm Margie Veruska. I am the Historical Committee Chair for the Women Military Aviators Organization. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm uh, talking to you from Cape Canaveral, Florida. The Women Military Aviators were established in the early 1980s soon after women were allowed to fly again in the military. And I say again, because we weren't the first, 
The very first women to fly in the military were the women Air Force service pilots of World War II. They were called the WASP. And it wasn't until 30 years later that women were accepted again into the military to fly. Uh, the Navy accepted the first women pilots in 1973. And soon after the Air Force, the Coast Guard, the Army, and eventually the Marines uh, took, that took place as well. We started the organization, uh, the Women Military Aviators, in the early 80s so that, well, not only to provide a legacy for the WASP, but also um, many of us were the only women in our squadrons. We were absolutely in a minority anywhere we went. And we needed to provide some camaraderie, a way to share information, concerns, ideas, and even give each other some strength and support. So we uh, started WMA and uh, eventually um, we came up with the uh, mission in addition to all the other things we were doing to preserve, promote, and protect the history of women in military aviation. And this isn't just pilots, but it's also navigators, load masters, engineers, um, boom operators from tanker aircraft and, uh, and the like. So uh, our organization has grown to hundreds and hundreds of members. Uh, at one point, the WASP outnumbered uh, uh, more modern women, but now, uh, unfortunately, it's the opposite way around. Um, I am part of the historical committee and our job uh, directly supports our mission. And uh, we have started an oral history program, which um, is using their story and permanent and aviary to uh, not only document, but preserve the oral histories that we do. Um, one of the things that we have done to make it a little bit easier on ourselves is develop a strategy when it comes to um, accomplishing these oral history sessions. Uh, the WASP we term generation one since they were the first women to fly for the military. The second generation starts with the Navy women in 1973 who were the very first. And the picture you see on the slide by the way is the Air Force women. And I was in the Air Force so that's why I chose this slide. But it goes up until 1993, which was when repeal of the combat exclusion law had been passed and women were then allowed to fly in combat. For 20 years, 1973 to 1993, women were not allowed to fly fighters, bombers, attack, reconnaissance, any of the uh, fast, sexy jets that um, the guys got to fly. But for those 20 years uh, where we were restricted in the aircraft that we could fly, I flew uh, transport, for example, we call ourselves generation two. And the women who could fly pretty much anything they wanted, they're generation three. So our focus as historians has been on generation two. And unfortunately, the impetus for getting these stories down is because some of our members are actually passing away. And we wanna make sure that we can document their careers, um, what they've been thinking and feeling, not only in those early days, but how they look back and perceive their careers. Um, I think I'll stop right there, but if anybody has questions later, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thank you so much, Margie. Um, we are going to hear from the American Muslim Health Professionals and Dr. Lance Laird is going to be sharing a little bit about them. So thank you very much, uh, and Margie, that's a, a fantastic project. I'm here to be inspired by all of you who are doing these projects. So I um, became involved with, I'm, I'm a, a professor of medical anthropology at the Boston University School of Medicine, speaking from Boston today. Um, I became involved with the American Muslim Health Professionals in 2006. I was moving from a comparative religion teaching position and retraining in medical anthropology. And my research was uh, focusing on the intersection of Islam, Muslim identities, and healing. And I applied for this small research grant to study the emergence of Muslim free clinics around the country, uh, beginning about 1996 and sort of mushrooming uh, in the decades thereafter. Uh, and AMP, as the American Muslim Health Professionals is known for short, um, was then a small organization with some dynamic young first and second generation immigrant leaders with a vision for civic engagement and social justice that really distinguished them from older Muslim medical associations in the country. 
And some of these leaders were organizing free clinics, but many of them saw beyond acute and chronic care to the broader systems of health promotion and innovation. And for the past four years, I've been collaborating with a, a research team from different uh, universities and AMP to do a quantitative survey to create a directory and bring together leaders of Muslim free clinics. And we were preparing an article on these clinics for a journal issue on Muslim philanthropy. And I began to think of, um, of AMP also as a philanthropic organization through which Muslim professionals donated their time, energies, and expertise, not only to American Muslim communities, but to the general public. And it's a, I think it's a really interesting story. It's only 18, an organization that's 18 years old and, uh, and fortunately its leaders are not, um, are not dying off. So this is not this sort of historical preservation project, but it's really chronicling this narrative of how an organization grew from just a networking lit, listserv to um, one of the uh, most important uh, faith-based uh, Muslim voices in public health in the United States. Um, so it was an interesting story with interesting people. And, um, and I thought it would be important to document it. This is how my project came about. Um, and we've collected about a dozen interviews with uh, some dynamic young leaders um, and hope to collect more and collect uh, sort of documentary history as well as part of an archive with permanent. So I thank you very much for, uh, for inspiring us. Thank you so much, Lance. Next, we're going to turn it over to Heather, who is going to share about the Peel Baltimore's Community Museum. Hello, everyone. My name is Heather Shelton, and I am the digital curator and registrar at the Peel, um, which a lot of folks don't know is America's oldest purpose built museum. Um, it was founded in 1814 by an American artist called Rembrandt Peel. So if you've ever heard of the Peel family of American artists, um, this is one of the many sons who turned out to be famous painters in their own right. Um, but he sort of had a business venture in the, the 18-teens thinking he could make, um, make a run of it in Baltimore with a, a brand new museum. And it opened in 1814, um, a gallery of uh, famous founders, et cetera. And the museum uh, displayed things like mastodon skeletons and even the Star Spangled Banner. Um, it was displayed here the first time before any other museum. Um, but the Peel Museum as it existed at that point closed in 1829. It became Baltimore's first city hall. Um, after that, it became the first uh, secondary school for African American um, students in Baltimore. Um, it's had so many lives. Um, it was an organ factory, as you can actually see on the photo, the top photo there with the sign. It was a sign factory, and it was threatened with demolition um, in the 1930s, and the people of Baltimore came together to save it. It became a museum again from about 1930 to 1997. And this is all related to oral histories because in 1997, the museum itself closed, the collection was sold and uh, much of it was given to uh, the Maryland Historical Society, which is now the Maryland Center for History and Culture. So 1997 comes around, the building is vacant for close to 20 years. And if you know anything about historic preservation or if you live in an old building, worked in an old building, in 20 years, a historic structure really doesn't do well. Um, so in about 2016, 2017, there were a group of folks that really wanted to save the building yet again. And uh, we reopened um, in the building but without any collections. There are no collections in this building today. Um, everything that we have today is born digital and encompasses uh, a number of oral histories. We started collecting about six years ago, the stories of folks in Baltimore. And that's really our mission is to elevate the stories of, of people who have traditionally been left out of the cultural narrative. And today we have close to 2000 oral histories. 
Um, that's where permanent comes in and that's where their story comes in. So permanent really stepped in in a time that we're trying to create a plan for the long-term outcome for these stories. Not all of them are traditional oral histories. Um, they range in, in length from one minute up to more than an hour. So some of them are more like stories versus oral histories, but all of them have um, a place in our collection. Uh, and that was really the motivation, the goal in getting involved with permanent is figuring out how to have a more permanent storage for content that up to this point really hasn't been archived. So we're in the beginning stages of our process of um, archiving our stories, doing inventories, et cetera. So a small organization that's really just um, starting out, but is really excited about the prospect of sharing these stories eventually with a much larger, larger audience. Thank you, Heather, for sharing um, so much of the Peel's history. That is, I just learned so much in that three minute period. Um, we are going to hear from Cynthia, who is here representing E4 Youth. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Cynthia. Hi, thank you. Uh, I am Cynthia Reese. I'm representing E4 Youth. It's a nonprofit based in Austin, Texas but I am calling in from Arlington, Texas. Um, grateful to be able to work remotely and connect with you all remotely as well. Um, so our mission at E4U, as you can see on the slide, we do um, work with BIPOC youth, mostly high school through college age, although we are expanding to elementary students as well. Um, but our mission, you know, we just want to make sure that we're engaging them when they feel a little lost and unsure of what they wanna do. We empower them to know that they have the skills already necessary to be creative and powerful in their own right. And then we start to educate them on uh, pathways to creative and tech jobs. Um, and then eventually we work to employ them with partners around the Austin area and then also national and global partners. Uh, we have so many former alumni who are hired by advertising agencies, creative ind industries, uh, movie production companies, uh, you name it. We have a lot of really cool people doing great things. Um, but with our, uh, with the permanent, what they've been helping us do is build our Austin Digital Heritage Project. And if you look at the link, uh, I have the archive in progress. That is our platform that we've built to start uh, collecting these histories in the Austin, Texas area. And we've realized we're focusing more on locations um, that have gone through the gentrification process. Unfortunately, Austin looks very different than it did, uh, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And it's common in every major city across the U.S. And so what we're doing is really trying to capture the history of these locations and then also interview the residents who have been on you know in these neighborhoods for years and years and trying to capture their stories um, and our hope eventually is to kind of do what the peel foundation was doing or uh, the peel community museum is that we want to capture the oral histories of austin residents from the past and the present so that way we can preserve the legacy of the black and brown history of austin um, and we are kind of in the the beginning stages of our archive as well we're realizing that we can't house everything in Google Drive. Um, it's really, it gets really messy really fast, especially the way our program is set up when we have multiple groups of students coming in at different times and trying to give them different access. And we realized permanent kind of makes it a very neat and orderly process to, to save those files. And so we're working through that right now. Um, and it's been, a great learning experience and we're super excited to see where this work takes us. Thank you so much, Cynthia, and sorry for jumping ahead during your talk. Um, let's go ahead and hear from Marissa, who is here for the Washington State Jewish Historical Society. Yeah, thank you. Um, before I start, um, I just wanted to acknowledge Margie because my grandmother who passed away recently was in the Women's Army Corps and uh, quite an extraordinary person. And she talked a lot about 
um, just how it gave her a lot of opportunities and also kind of gave her a bit of a um, more of a window into the greater world because she grew up in South Texas. Um, all right, uh, so yes, I am um, the archivist um, for the Washington State Jewish Historical Society. Um, you can see our mission statement um, on the slide. And we are small but mighty. Uh, we focus on the history of Jews in Washington State um, from 1850 to present day. Um, one of our main motivations for wanting to create a, a digital archive is um, we jointly manage the Jewish archives at the University of Washington. And unfortunately, the University of Washington has made it clear to us that they are all out of physical and digital space to store materials. And as everyone knows, history is not static. It does not stop at a particular point. Um, it is living. And we, instead of seeing this as a detriment, we saw this as an opportunity. Um, there's a lot of hidden history as well as hidden collections in Jewish organizations in Washington state, as well as from local community. And we, really wanted to preserve, save, and share this history, as well as make it accessible um, to a larger audience. And we are at the very beginning um, of our digital museum project. Uh, well, it's technically more of the pre-planning stages. Um, we receive funding from the Washington State Legislature, and our project officially starts um, on July 1st. And one of um, our goals and how we envision this museum in the future is seeing it as a sustainable community museum where we can curate digital exhibitions. Local community can curate their own digital exhibitions and we can safely store and preserve digital collections and as well as continue to foster awareness and appreciation of Jewish history in Washington state. And we have a, a two phases of our project. Uh, the first phase will go from July 1st to June 30th. And uh, we're going to build out the internal structure of the museum, um, creating a blueprint for cataloging, uploading materials into permanent, including collection policies, object taxonomy, best practices, all of our current digital material, because we do have a digital museum um, on our website uh, will be migrated into permanent. So once uh, we're all finished with that, uh, the museum will serve as part curated exhibition space, um, a digital repository for Jewish collections and function as a museum and educational resource where local community can upload and share stories, memories, and histories. And in the second phase of this project, uh, we're going to actively seek out and work with organizations around Washington State, including congregations, synagogues, smaller historical societies and museums that have Jewish material in their collections. And we plan to scan, upload, and preserve all that material in permanent, kind of helping to not only foster um, collaboration between local community organizations and institutions, but also more importantly, making all of this material accessible for future generations. And uh, I, um, I feel very strongly about this project because I feel like we're really creating something that doesn't currently exist. So we're not just creating a, an archive that is kind of rooted in the past. We're creating an archive that starts in the past, connects to the present, and continues on to the future. And uh, in Judaism, um, there's a belief that as long as you're remembering someone, that memory is enough to keep them alive. And um, it's something that I very much believe in. And I just love the idea that we are creating living history and sharing these memories and stories um, with future generations. Thank you, Marissa. I. Um... I just, I love that all of you touched a little bit on the aspect of 
storytelling as well as story keeping and preservation and uh, making sure that those stories, those histories live on and um, have a space in the future. So we are going to jump right into our panel discussion. So as I mentioned during the intro, if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the chat and Zach and I will ask them um, as we get to them. We have a set of questions as well, so um, no pressure, but we encourage everyone here to ask the questions that you want to ask because now is your chance. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing so that we can have full screen video of our panelists. Okay. And Zach, um, would you like to kick us off with the first question? Happy to. Um, I Yeah, I loved hearing all of the, the stories and, and I think there's really uh, a good breadth in terms of um, where each project is at from kind of early stages getting started to you know, the Peel Museum 2000 oral histories in. And so I, I'd be curious to, uh, which uh, is incredible. Um, and I'd be curious to hear what were some of the, the early challenges that, um, that each of you experienced and how did you get, get over those? And maybe uh, Heather, I'll point that question to you first, but would love to open it up to, uh, to other panelists as well. Kind of what, what were some of those early stage challenges, even just like fears or reservations of diving into coming out of a, you know, from, from a physical to totally digital um, environment. Um, what did that look like for you? How'd you get over some of those early challenges in, uh, in your project? Well, I think um, when I stepped in, Zach, we had already amassed um, probably 1500 of these stories. So stepping into an archive, and I'll use that loosely because I know Cynthia might have referenced the Google Drive, but stepping into the Google Drive world and seeing the, the disorganization was mind-numbingly difficult for me because I'm sort of a, a you know, person that likes to put things in nice, neat boxes and folders. Um, so really at the outset, it was the challenge of knowing that we had all of this content that had up to that point not been organized. I mean, literally it's, you know, if you can imagine um, a physical archive and going into a space where you have many, many linear feet, thousands of linear feet of boxes of collections that you've never, that no one has ever processed. Um, so translating that to the digital space, you know, that was a challenge. And I think it really took us probably two years to even think about what we had. And that is the, the process of going through and inventory um, those, those assets, those, those narratives that we've collected in just the, the six years that we have been reopened as a museum. So that is the biggest challenge. And I think it's also an opportunity because there's an element of discovery in there um, that you really just don't know what you're gonna find and you might find something really, really precious. But I think one of the things that I've learned along those lines is that, um, you know, the fact that we're hearing from everyone and that we're allowing everybody to tell their story is in its own right, you know, very, very satisfying because again, we're broadening the perspective of what it means to, to grow up in a city like Baltimore that for a lot of people has a bad rap um, and that, you know, folks only know shows like The Wire. So for a long time, one of the things that we were trying to do is to get people to see Baltimore in a new light. And I think with that goal in mind, it really helps us uh, reframe the idea of what our purpose is. I love that. And it's, uh, yeah, in inheriting a, uh, a collection of uh, 1500 uh, recordings, I imagine would uh, definitely be uh, a lot to wade, wade through. Um, I'm curious, you know, Cynthia, and I see some questions coming in in the, the chat as well, and uh, we'll get to some of these in, in a moment here. Um, but I, I'm curious maybe to ask a similar question to, to you as well, because I think you have a really interesting program that was really built with kind of multiple stakeholders in mind. There's both the 
elders in the community and these different neighborhoods. And then it's also engaging youth as the people who might even be conducting some of those interviews. And, and I imagine that presents its, its own challenges in, in its own right, but incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful when, when done well. Uh, so what, what did that look like for you in terms of challenges in kind of orchestrating uh, these multiple stakeholders in, in this sort of program? Yeah, so um, again, you know, like coming out of the pandemic, as you know, however you want to frame that, we worked with sister nonprofits who had more, who had already had relationships built with some elders in the community. So like at certain senior, uh, senior recreation centers and things like that. Um, and they were already thinking around oral history projects. So we didn't have to look too far uh, to find some people to interview. And then what we started realizing, uh, there's kind of two moving parts to this, is that within certain locations, especially depending on their historical um, reference, like we're doing one with an elementary school right now about their principal and some of the, the ways that school was first established. And we got to interview his great granddaughter, I believe. Um, but our, our kids, our youth are realizing like, if we didn't do this, it wouldn't exist. Like it's not been captured anywhere else. And one of my college kids was getting frustrated because he's like, I don't have anything to back this up. Like he's so used to doing that research of like citing something. And I'm like, no, you're creating the research right now. Like you are capturing it. And so we don't have anything else to go off of. Um, the other thing about it, I mentioned the elementary school it's not so much that they're going out and interviewing the elders, but we're teaching them that their story matters too. And so we're trying to capture their experience as like a fifth grader in Austin, right? Like how, what does the city mean to you? What does your neighborhood mean to you? What does your school mean to you? And how can we capture that? So that way in 20 years, 30 years, hundred years, someone can look back at that and be like, oh, that elementary school was in that area. And that's what they went through because we don't have that for the locations that we're currently researching. Um, yeah, and so the challenge, I feel like we got lucky with some of our sister nonprofits um, and then that we're able to have a good partnership with local school districts who are willing to let us go in and work with these younger kids. Um, but really it's the lack of information that exists about the history of Austin um, for these specific communities. So trying to overcome that hurdle, but at the same time, it just bolsters the work we're doing. We know that it's necessary and, and important. Yeah, absolutely. The, that lack of information is a, a motivating factor. Uh, it also sounds like you've had some very willing um, partnerships, which is fantastic. And uh, yeah, I, I, I love that like shift or that, that moment where the student is thinking about, oh, I don't have anything to back this up. Uh, like, but but the story itself that uh, that is being preserved is that is a uh, primary record um, that uh, that others can can now access and learn from. Um, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, maybe Amanda, I'll uh, segue it back to you if you want to follow up with your curiosities. Yeah, of course. Actually, there's some great questions in the chat. So I am going to um, go straight to chat. And there's a question from Carter. Hey, Carter. Um, how do we make digital archives and narratives accessible and understandable for more analog community members? So maybe people who aren't as tech savvy. Um, and what have you all done in your organizations or preservation projects to address that. And I'm opening it up to all five of you. I think one of the first things that comes to my mind is um, we also use their story to like upload our videos. And one of the things we like about their story is it, it does a trans, uh, transcription for you. And we are able to edit that out and like make a Google Doc for it. And so that transcription then becomes searchable um, and that could be a downloadable PDF. We haven't gotten to that point yet where we have all of those resources accessible, but that's our future goal. So I think it would be interesting for someone to come to our archive, 
see, you know, maybe the pictures, whatever, but then also if they want to read it or print it out, they have a, a way to do that. And then even with the video histories that we're creating, we're doing our best to do captions for it uh, for our hard of hearing community. Um, mm -hmm. Little things like that make a big difference. Um, I think those are the two major ways uh, that people can. And then the other part is having these out in the community somewhere to make them more accessible. Uh, again, partnering with our sister nonprofits, they did a mural of the elementary school we're doing the history of. And so we've got our barcode that's gonna go on that mural and people can access it that way. Again, that is for more digital users, but at least the analog part, I guess, is the mural piece. So we've been trying to figure out how to, you know, get the word out there that these, um, that this program and this <laughs> is, is out there, yeah. Yeah, I love that, that you have something big and visible that like is really representative of the project and might draw people in, um, but it's not necessarily, it, it obviously isn't the full scope of the project. There's so much more to be uncovered there. So that's great. Does anybody else have um, other ways that they address this issue? We did something similar um, to Cynthia at the Peel last year. We had an exhibition of larger than life size banners of community members who were involved with an oral history project. So there were 13 women from around Baltimore who had, um, they were essentially change makers in their communities. and. We had um, a photographer in one of the neighborhoods go around and take their photographs like an official portrait. Um, those were in turn, you know, turned into, let's say six by nine, I mean, very, very large um, cloth banners that we put on display with uh, traditional museum labels and then a QR code to their story. So those stories were then posted with a complete transcript, um, but the analog component was the, you know, the actual, um, the vinyl panels and the photographs. And we were really excited because at one point, um, our city hall, the new city hall, which was built in, you know, the late 19th century <laughs> is sort of catty cornered to the peel. And lo and behold, we um, realized one day that, that we had had actually banners, our banners were being um, hung from City Hall. So it was really an exciting moment, but a, again, a low tech analog way of connecting um, those oral histories with um, the digital files themselves. Yeah, I love that too, because it serves another purpose, which I'm sure you intentionally um, did this, but to share representation of folks in the community. Um, I think that's a really important part of doing this type of work and um, making sure that underrepresented folks are included in the, the historical record as well and showing people that they are um, so that they see themselves in that. That's awesome. Thank you, Heather. And I saw somebody was going to steal that idea in the chat. Any others? Okay, um, let's see, let me go back to chat. Um, let's see. Are there technologies to embed audio and digital into analog pieces like murals? I think, um, I know e for youth has done some um, work with augmented reality. Is that um, maybe one of the ways yeah, I was going to mention that the um, for South by Southwest, we launched uh, what we called the What Once Was project, again, working with other local uh, sister nonprofits. But uh, basically what you do is like when you go to these historical locations, you can scan the barcode with your phone. If you have Instagram or Facebook um, and our student, uh, I say one student learned this AR technology to basically create a filter. So like there is a, um, a pinata store that's no longer in existence on the east side of Austin, it's called Jumpalin, but the building is still there. It's now ironically an 
advertising agency. Um, and when you go to that building, if you point your phone at it, pinatas jump up at you. So if you've ever seen like those VR filters or whatever, um, there's another one. Of, there was a hillside pharmacy, which is now a restaurant, used to be an actual drugstore owned by a Black family. Um, on the east side of Austin. So when you go there, it has like pill bottles that open and things like that, just to show you like, you know, what used to be there. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different ways to embed technology. The VR and AR though, I think is what really captures people's attention to say like, well, what is this? So. All right. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Has anybody else done anything with technologies beyond um, QR codes or anything along the lines of what Cynthia just shared? I think there's a lot of potential there um, in really getting, getting collections out and engaging the community. So I am going to turn it back over to Zach for the next question. So I wanted to um, kind of segue uh, away from challenges for, for a moment and maybe on, on the flip side of that, some of the moments for, for each of you in your projects that have um, been moments that either you've been most proud of or moments that have kind of stuck out to you as impactful or, or stories that, that you've heard from the community um, from the engagement that, that you've done. And so Maybe I'll start with uh, uh, Margie, kind of moments that stand out to you based on your engaging in this process that have been really meaningful uh, uh, to you. Oh, we have so many um, interviews that are, are very uh, interesting and impactful. Um, recently, um, we started a 9-11 project and we asked our members what, where were you and what were you doing on 9-11? And these were solo sessions so that uh, a member could simply access the link on our website and start talking about what they were doing on 9-11. And uh, we got some really great stories that way. Fantastic. And so that was uh, even outside of just like a traditional interview, that was actually just using a link, <laughs> having someone kind of self-record Exactly. Uh, it was a little bit different than our, our typical oral history process, and uh, it worked pretty well. I wish we'd gotten even more uh, folks to do that, but what we might do in the future when we do our, um, our oral histories, we almost always ask about 9-11 because that's a, a, a fairly undocumented um, area with uh, the women pilots and uh, air crew. And so what, as I understand, I haven't done it yet, but we can take excerpts that are uh, inside uh, an actual interview and take that out and make a new file. So we can add that to our 9-11 files. So we're pretty excited about that. Absolutely, yeah. I think highlighting those kind of key moments um, mm -hmm. within a, a broader interview can definitely be a powerful way to draw people in yeah. and say, ooh, what, what else uh, might've been said or exactly. discussed? Yeah, exactly. totally. What, what about for you, uh, Lance, and kind of, I think you said you've gone through now 12 interviews. I'm curious, what's what stood out to you? What have been the kind of proud moments or, or stories that, that kind of stuck stuck with you? No, I think it's been, it's been really interesting uh, for me. And like I said, this is a young organization um, and, and the people leading it are also a lot younger than I am. Um, and uh, just the, I mean, one of the things that's impressed me is the is the energy and the and the um, the ways in in which uh, people have expressed their devotion to the to the cause of uh, of public health and and uh, public service. Um, and I I think the um, what's been really interesting to to me is that sort of in asking in asking the for the stories of their of their involvement, everybody sort of comes in uh, in a in a different way and and finds a home in this in this organization to express something they've always wanted to do but weren't doing in medical school or public health school or something like that, and finds a voice and a way to connect with the Muslim community that's not you know for, uh, 
I mean, people who study American Islam, you know, recognize that, you know, two thirds of the Muslim community doesn't grace the door of a mosque on a regular basis. And so this is a, this is a way for, for people who, who may or may not be particularly religiously engaged, but are very much inspired by their religious tradition. And I, I've been digging into some of those questions and finding some, uh, some really interesting answers about what it means to be Muslim in America. And that's, that's you know, my real interest is in, is in that and the variety of ways that people express that. How, um, I, I'm curious, how did you um, find or, or reach out to that initial kind of cohort of, of narrators of, of interviewees? I know Cynthia talked before about, at least with one of their projects, they had partnered with a senior center um, for you, um, what did that look like in terms of finding that initial cohort of, of interviewees? So, I mean, working directly with the, the uh, woman who is currently the executive director and another woman who is the, the founder and current development director. And they were extremely helpful in just sort of making a list. Here are the people who've been in leadership and on the board over the past uh, years. And we sort of tried to make a timeline and, and uh, and they helped us get in touch with folks who didn't respond to our emails. Um, and, uh, you know, so have, have helped us in, in recruiting folks. And they've been very open about, you know, here are some people who may have grievances about the organization, but please interview them. Um, you know, so I think that's the openness that they've shown and the, and the collaboration uh, in the project has been extremely helpful. Uh, and then sort of snowballing from there. Who else should I talk to um, in each interview? Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, that that's how it's looked uh, so far. Awesome. I wanted to go back for a moment um, and thinking more on the side of, um, uh, and this is more a, a personal curiosity, you know, certainly as the, you know, the founder of a, uh, oral history, you know, remote interviewing transcription platform, you know, that's, that's on the collecting phase, but something that jumped out to me before was um, both Marissa, what you were talking about, kind of phase one of your project is kind of organizing that information in, in permanent. And, and similarly, Heather had talked about inheriting a, you know, a large collection and step one was kind of wading through what was there. So I, I'm curious to hear maybe Marissa, how, how you're thinking of approaching that challenge of getting material into the system, organizing it, uh, any frameworks uh, that you're using around metadata and, and, you know, and then I'd love to kind of compare and contrast Heather with your experience of diving into an existing collection and how, how you went about that, that organization process. Um, but Marissa, yeah, if you want to. Yeah, I would, I would be happy to answer that. Um, it's, it's something that our organization has had to not necessarily figure out, but more focus on because we were more of a community and outreach based organization. So having to kind of take a really deep look at what are our collection policies? What are our accession policies? What type of material should we collect? Um, and kind of updating that to reflect our current mission statement as well as, okay, how can we use what we have to build a solid foundation? Um, and also, I'll, I'll say our project hasn't started yet. Uh, July 1st is our, our start date. Um, but of course, um, you know, we have thought a lot about this because we only have a year to complete this project um, in terms of getting state funding. Um, and it's kind of personally, it's been a good learning experience for me because I don't have a lot of experience working with digital collections. Um, mostly physical collections, um, but we've retained the services of a um, consultant, Rachel Woody, who's going to kind of help us through that project and create metadata and taxonomy as well as best practices. Um, but I, I would say largely, it's gonna be a learning experience. I mean, obviously the project that we kind of envision right now I mean, it'll be similar at the end, but it'll probably come together in a lot of unexpected ways. And we'll learn kind of more about 
what we have and okay, how can we make it fit this or okay, this doesn't work. How can we try something else? Heather, any any uh, tips or, or recommendations <laughs> for how in the world, uh, you know, within a, a year time frame, Marissa and team are going to be able to uh, uh, pull everything off? Oh, Lord, Marissa, I feel for you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's exciting. But I mean, I, I definitely would say to everybody, you don't know what you don't know. So mm -hmm. getting into it, I really feel like being flexible is really critical because you might do a hard right or a hard left midway through. And I think you have to be okay with that. Um, when we started doing the, the, you know, a formal archiving process, um, you know, I come from a collections management background, but didn't have um, a, a strong, you know, library services background, a, an MLS or anything like that. So my tendency was to go one way. And then as I learned more, I started veering off in another direction. And at first I really resisted that, um, knowing that there were standards and best practices that we needed to adhere to. Um, but at the same time, I think ultimately you have to do what's best for your organization and what is what your organization is capable of doing as far as the, the capacity that you have to get that work done. So whatever you can get done in a year's time is what you can get done in a year's time. And I think, you know, from our point of view, we've learned that um, a crooked path is better than no path at all. <laughs> I mean, to some extent, we haven't taken a linear, um, a linear path with this, because like I said, the more you know, in some ways, the more information you want to collect, the more metadata you, you feel like you need. Um, but ultimately, it's just about setting those guidelines and being willing to um, go with the flow, I think, with, with all of this. I, I liked what you said about going with the flow, Heather, and um, I would also just add that one of the benefits of being a smaller nonprofit is there's not all these set standards and hierarchies of you have to use this system, this is what we've always done, oh, well, our organization only uses this. It's a little bit like a choose your own adventure um, and you can kind of take what works and leave the rest. I was gonna say, I really appreciate that too. I mean, I when I was trying to design, this is the first sort of oral history project I've done. I'm used to doing interviews and analyzing interviews, but not really cataloging or <laughs> um, putting together a, a document collection. Um, and I think my in my imagination, what we were going to do is we were going to read through all the documents that the organization had produced over over the last 20 years. And then we were going to select who to interview about particular events and and um, and go in depth. And what what we discovered is is that the documents were in multiple drives in multiple people's closets and you know, that the, the documents had never been organized um, before. And so, uh, you know, and, and I think this has been the gift of permanent is like, hey, <laughs> we need to get this organized and stored so that um, we, can, we can preserve it. But just getting it organized, I mean, it's, um, it has taken several months just to get a, a set of folders where everything is, is, is in there now. And I've, done most of the interviews already. And I think, you know, once we go through the documents, I may want to do some follow-up interviews to get some more specifics, uh, but it certainly didn't go the way that I had planned it. I, I imagine that that is, uh, and I see a lot of uh, people echoing the sentiment of the struggle is real around uh, that kind of organization. Um, and I, I'm also imagining that for, for most, uh, if not all the panelists here, in each of the different projects that they've engaged in that uh, uh, there was the plan and then there was the reality. Um, and I, I'm curious maybe to hear a little bit more about some of those sorts of instances, you know, maybe uh, Margie kind of, uh, I'm curious how, how did the, uh, what you imagine the work of collecting the stories from Gen 2 uh, women aviators, um, 
how how did you imagine that was going to look? How did that look in, in reality? What were some of those kind of surprises uh, along the way? Well, one thing we did right off, and we did this because the woman I work with, Marcy, um, she was a strategic planner, a full colonel at the Pentagon. And that's what she does is organize and uh, implement strategy. So she came up with a way to define the generations that I mentioned, Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3. And then we decided to concentrate on one generation, which is still almost overwhelming when you look at the number of uh, people that we would like to interview, hundreds and hundreds, and then convincing them that each of these stories is very important. It doesn't matter if you were the first to do something or you, you got to fly a certain jet or went on a certain mission, every single story is important. So that was one of our challenges is to convince people to, to take part. And then once we get all the information is how to organize it and Permanent is helping us do that because we can create a folder on each person and not only will it contain their oral history, but it can, um, we can upload photos, um, other documents, uh, medals and awards, that kind of thing. And uh, then we found out in uh, the 9-11 uh, folder is an example of this, we could create subject specific collections. And uh, one of our other collections is the uh, effort to repeal the combat exclusion law. And so now that's a whole nother aspect of our strategy. But when you look at the whole scope of it, it it's pretty big. So we have to kind of downsize and we assign uh, certain interviews to each person and we just are trying to um, turn them out and get them transcribed and organize them and it's an ongoing almost all time process. Yeah, that's that's interesting the different ways to kind of think about organizing one like by person mm -hmm. um, but then also by kind of specific subject like uh, exactly and there's some yeah. cross referencing there too. Right, right. What, what about for you Cynthia kind of su surprises uh, uh, along the way um, uh, from what you had uh, initially imagined or just kind of that, that that happened where you had to kind of pivot uh, uh, quickly? Well, I think um, one of our challenges is the audio capturing of it when you're dealing with, um, you know, people in their 80s and 90s and trying not to say, can you repeat that like over and over because some of them don't have the stamina to, to do an interview for that long or repeated. Um, and we've learned after capturing like an hour interview or something and then going back to upload the audio that it didn't come through the way we were hoping to. So then we really had to pick and choose like, okay, do we redo the whole thing or do we only focus on a set of questions? Do we work with what we have and maybe just, you know, use a snippet of it? So little things like that start to add up. Um, and then I think one of the, a good surprise we've had is just the relationships that we've seen. Um, like, I don't know if it's relationships, but just the validation, I guess. Like uh, I mentioned it was the principal's great granddaughter, but I relooked, it's his daughter. He was a principal in the 1930s in East Austin and she's still alive. And for us to be telling his story, she's like, I know that this matters, you know, and she's well in her, I believe she's like in her eighties now, but it's been really cool to see our students when they're capturing those interviews, just that validation come through and they, they want to make sure that, you know, that they continue doing this. I think piggybacking on, on what Cynthia said, one of the things that's been rewarding for us is to get folks saying things like, wait, you want to interview me? And we, we have uh, made a concerted effort to talk to folks who are involved with the physical renovation of our building. So our building was an under renovation on and off for five years. And in earnest in the last two years where we were close to the public, um, we had electricians, we had master masons, we had plumbers, we had, I mean, you name it when it comes to craftspeople. And we really wanted to talk to the electricians and the plumbers and, you know, my background's in historic preservation. So I really wanted to know what they were up to, but they were so surprised that we wanted to talk to them. And I think that that was a wonderful um, turn of events that you know, they felt validated in the work that they had actually physically done on the building.
Yeah, I, I, uh, I can only imagine the surprise of the electrician coming in and saying, hey, can I record your, your story? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, did, did, would they, uh, did they have that same sort of um, uh, what, uh, reservation uh, that kind of like Margie talked about having to get over really like saying, no, your story matters? Uh, or was it a like, oh, why me? But okay, like I'll, I'll share it. Or did, did you have to overcome kind of some of those like, no, 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 I, I don't, you don't want my story. Um, kind there of. were definitely some of those. I mean, I think once the ice was broken, they were more than willing to talk about, you know, what it was that they had worked on and why their part of the piece of the puzzle fit together so nicely with the big picture. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it did little, take a little bit of convincing to talk to them about why we were collecting their stories. And um, I mean, across the board, sometimes people really need to be reminded that, as everyone has said, that their stories are part of a bigger narrative. And that regardless of whether or not you are in charge or you have a PhD behind your name or whatever it happens to be, that your perspective is really critical to cultural heritage. So we, we, you know, work on that a lot to try to break the ice with folks, but um, sometimes it's easier than others to get people involved. Yeah. A any other sort of tips or, or tricks or phrasing? I, I, one thing that stood out to me was just kind of emphasizing that their story is a part of a, of a bigger narrative. Um, any other sort of like phrasing or tips or tricks to kind of get over that? Like, why does my story matter? Um, something I think, I don't know that I've mentioned this, but, you know, with the gentrified location, there are some that have been replaced by like, so the restaurant I mentioned, Hillside Pharmacy, it's now, they spell pharmacy with a, with an F instead of the PH because it's like farm to table, right? Um, and we have, we're working on interviewing those current owners who are in this historical location not so that way they're painted as the bad guy, right? Who came in, but can you be part of the story moving forward now? Do you recognize the history and you know what you've kind of taken over um, regardless of intention or whatever? Um, because they had their own struggles during the pandemic. They almost shut down completely. And so some of the phrasing we've been working on with our college students is just, um, again, inviting them to be part of the story moving forward and not villainizing anybody or whatever, because there's a lot of contention around gentrification, you know? Um, and so we're, we're trying really to just phrase it as an invitation always, and then see where it leads to from there. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I, I might wanna go back um, kind of along maybe some of those lines. Um, it just reminded me of a question that was asked earlier um, in the chat, and then I'll pass it back to you, uh, Amanda. But uh, uh, JB had, had asked, what, what are the challenges facing people of color to getting their stories online and accessible to their communities? What is the outreach around that aspect of your work? And Cynthia, I, I'm curious if there are any particular things that jump out to you um, as you think about your work uh, with JB's question. Well, I think fortunately it's becoming more of a of an expectation that cities start to recognize their people of color and that they do have a place in that history. Um, it's been, I think, again, working with our sister nonprofits who are already established in Austin uh, with city council, with the Austin Historical Center, we're starting to be able to capture those stories more. Um, and there's even Instagram has been a really cool way to kind of get these stories out there. There's a, a, a group called the Atex uh, Barrio Archive, I believe, and they've contributed to a lot of pictures and stories for us. Um, the Carver Museum in Austin has a lot of um, resources for us. And so it's, to me, it hasn't been as challenging as I thought it would be. It's just finding the resources out there. So that way, again, in 10, 20, 50 years, it's not as challenging that this becomes more, uh, you know, accessible. Yeah, yeah, and it, sound, and it sounds like partnering with, with organizations, uh, as you said, that are already making an effort um, in, uh, in progress in, in that area. Yeah, 
Yeah. Amanda, I'll, I'll turn it back, back to you. Awesome. Thank you all so much um, for all of this rich information. I think we are probably close to winding down. So I do want to make sure we respect everyone's time. Um, but before, before I wrap up, I just want to ask our panelists um, if there's anything else anything at all that you would like to share, especially with folks who are considering um, starting their own digital preservation project or using the tools um, that you all have used to start and do your preservation projects. Um, I'll go ahead. I'll go I, I just like to stress uh, how great their story and permanent staffs are. Um, anytime I've ever had a question, um, I, I know I, I don't have to hesitate to ask because um, they'll answer anything no matter how stupid <laughs> my part it is because um, I'm not that tech savvy, but um, their platforms, uh, even though they are state of the art, are, are very easy to use and the help if you need it is there. So I would highly recommend you giving it a try and I think you'll be very pleased. Thank you all. I would, I would second that and I'd also just like to reiterate the fact it's nice to have tech people behind the scenes because you know most small organizations don't have an IT department so uh, you know having Zach and Amanda and third-party tech folks behind the scenes that can answer questions and offer advice is really helpful when you're working with a small staff. I, I would echo that as well um, you know the staff at, at their story and, and permanent have been very helpful to us I, I will say that, you know, it looks easy and the technology um, is, is user friendly, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, it's, you know, the, the organizing and the recruiting and the, and the processing, even though AI does some transcription, you still have to clean it. You still have to spend hours going through things and, and, uh, and tagging and indexing and that takes a, a great deal of time and, and you need help. So don't try to do it on your own. Yeah, I can, I can go next. Um, again, we're still in the very early stages of our project, but I can also share that Amanda has been incredibly helpful. Like sometimes she'll even answer a question like 15 minutes after I send an email. And just to have that amount of consideration and response is really great. Um, again, we are, a very small organization and oftentimes, uh, well, we, we don't necessarily have the staff or resources. Um, the other thing I would add, and just kind of more from a personal perspective, it may seem a little intimidating, but it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to have everything perfectly planned out when you start, but you, you have to start somewhere and sometimes just having a loose outline, having, again, permanent support, and the enthusiasm to see the project through, because we are really excited about this project, and it shows, you know, people will pick up on that, and they'll be curious, they'll want to participate or engage. And I will be the next person to say yes. They're, the platforms are intuitive. Um, it's, you know, you have a question you can ask, but I've also appreciated with our online uh, cohort whenever we have our meetings. Um, I know both Amanda and Amberly have jumped on and met with our kids and talked them through certain things um, or they're open to it. Right now we're in a planning stage of like, how do we utilize these resources that we have available to us? Um, and so they're always willing to help out with that. And I think about last summer, we had a, what we call our industry studios, and they worked very closely with our students, basically mentoring them on, again, a creative field, you know, and some of our students were like, wow, I didn't know you could do this for a living. And it's like, yeah, it's really, it's a really cool thing to see that come full circle. Thank you all um, so much for sharing a little bit. Um, 
I do want to say that one of the main goals going forward with Bite for Bite is building a community of Bite for Bite partners. I think that up until now, we haven't really started bringing folks who um, participate in this program together. But as we grow the program, I would love to have more interactions like this. I'd love for us to be um, an ecosystem of support for one another. And of course, I am always here, Zach is always here, and we definitely want to support this work because it's at the heart of what we do and what our organizations do. So thank you all so, so much for being here. And thank you um, to our amazing panelists who shared so much about what you're doing. Um, I will go ahead and put the um, link to our Bite for Bite page in the chat again, along with my email. And I strongly encourage all of you, um, including our current Bite for Bite partners, if you want an intern, um, to go ahead and apply for that. And um, you will hear from us uh, by September 1st if you apply. So thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Amanda, for leading the session and uh, getting it all together. Thank you. Thanks for everyone who attended. Thank you. Thank you.